Um, welcome to today's webinar, uh, Planning for Equitable Mitigation. Um, thank you all for joining today. Um, this is the second webinar of the new series from Policy to Action, hosted by FEMA's National Mitigation Planning Program. Today's webinar is focused on equity in the mitigation planning process. By centering equity in the planning process, we can create a plan that benefits the whole community, and this includes its most vulnerable residents. Uh, as we get started today, please remember to put your name, location, uh, and how you have considered equity in a project or planning process in the chat. So we are joined today by our three presenters. Um, and I welcome the presenters to turn their cameras on during the introductions. Um, we will have the cameras off uh, largely during the presentation just to keep bandwidth um, issue, you know, refrain from any bandwidth issues. Um, and then we will uh, come back on during our Q&A session. So um, our first presenter is Shuba Srivastav. Um, she's a mitigation planner with FEMA's National Mitigation Planning Program. Um, Shuba will discuss how equity emerges in the hazard mitigation planning process and why equity should be centered in your efforts. Um, Shuba will also cover how equity is included in the 2022 updated mitigation planning policy guides. Our second presenter today is uh, Jackie Larenzar. Uh, uh, they are a race and equity analyst with the city of Oakland, California. Jackie will share their work on Oakland's equitable climate adaptation plan and how that the city had carried those uh, its equity focused planning processes into the local hazard mitigation plan. Um, finally, we are joined by Kate Judson. Um, Kate is the equity section chief, Office of Equity and Strategic Initiatives within the recovery directorate at FEMA. Kate's going to review data tools you can use to identify and engage socially vulnerable and disadvantaged groups in your community. And Kate will also discuss how both tools uh, and community conversations can make both mitigation planning um, and projects equitable. So before we get started, um, let's just go over a few housekeeping items. Um, all attendees are currently on mute and this will help to reduce any background noise. So please use the Q&A feature shown here on this slide um, to ask any questions during the webinar. We will type answers to the questions that come in through this Q&A feature throughout the webinar, uh, but we have also reserved um, some time at the end of the presentations to answer your questions live. Um, so uh, please be advised that you can uh, choose to self-identify or not in that Q&A feature. Should we not get a chance to respond to your question, you should feel free to uh, reach out to any of our presenters via email. We will provide their uh, contact information at the end of the webinar. And then finally, by attending this webinar in its entirety and taking part in the polling questions, you may be eligible for professional credits. Uh, this webinar offers uh, one American Institute of Certified Planners, AICP, certification maintenance credit. This is also an equity or EQ credit, which is a new required credit type for certification maintenance. Um, one Association of State Floodplain Managers, ASFPM, a continuing education credit. And if you are looking for the CEC uh, as a CFM, a certified floodplain manager, please remember that you need to be logged into the webinar uh, individually with your name and you must participate in the polling questions. We are recording this webinar today um, and we will be posting the recording on FEMA's website. So by attending this webinar, you consent to these conditions. Um, and again, please note you can choose to self-identify or not during the Q&A uh, for this recording. All right, so our first speaker today is Shuba Srivastav. Um, Shuba works at FEMA headquarters in the National Mitigation Planning Program. Uh, she is currently leading capability building through policy, training, and technical assistance. The National Mitigation Planning Program supports states, tribes, and local communities to plan strategically and to improve their long-term resilience. 
Currently, over 25,000 jurisdictions across the nation have participated in the development of mitigation plans for their communities. Before joining FEMA, Shuba worked in the private sector conducting mitigation, recovery, and resilience planning efforts for state and local governments and supporting FEMA's guidance development, plan reviews, trainings, grants, and floodplain management work under various contracts. Uh, Shuba holds a master's in urban and regional planning from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And she maintained her certification from AICP from 2005 to 2018 and continues to be a certified floodplain manager since 2003. All right, Shuba, I will pass it off to you. Thank you, Jessica. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm going to turn off my video for bandwidth purposes. Hopefully that is okay. So let's start by understanding what equity means before we talk about centering equity in mitigation. So this is FEMA's definition of equity based on the definition of equity found in the Executive Order 13985, advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. It talks about fair and just treatment of underserved communities and also describes the characteristics of those historically underserved communities. Equity is not the same as equality. You may have seen graphics illustrating the differences. Equity provides each member of the community resources to fit their needs. It does not mean everyone has the same resources because the same resources don't work for everyone. Equity means that systems and processes should be fair and work for all people, especially those who have been historically underserved and who may be socially vulnerable. We know that underserved communities and socially vulnerable populations often suffer disproportionately from disasters. As a result, disasters worsen existing inequities present in our communities and states. The Hazard Mitigation Plan provides the framework for addressing these inequities and reducing vulnerabilities. Through the planning process, jurisdictions can make sure their mitigation program benefits the whole community. And to do this, the updated mitigation planning policy guides ask um, to plan for equitable outcomes. The updated policies clarify that mitigation planning must be inclusive to ensure that all communities and people benefit from risk reduction. We have here the image from the FEMA strategic plan. So the mitigation planning policies are directly supporting FEMA's strategic goal, goal one. Um, and specifically 1.3, to achieve equitable outcomes for those we serve. FEMA is also advancing this goal through its 2022 Equity Action Plan, developed to address Executive Order 13985. As part of this, FEMA is providing direct support to underserved communities to invest in resilience through the Building Resilient Infrastructure in Communities, the BRIC grant program, States, local communities, tribes, and territories may use this grant for mitigation planning, adoption and enforcement of building codes and standards, project scoping, and small-scale mitigation product projects. So we're talking about underserved communities and socially vulnerable populations. What do these terms mean? Um, so we have defined them in our updated policy guides and in the new local mitigation planning handbook. The links to those um, are being posted by our team in the chat. And while I talk about the definitions a little bit, please think about the groups listed on these slides and think about who else may be disproportionately affected by disasters. So we're trying to bridge the gap of the, not the gap, but we're trying to combine basically the groups defined in the executive order as historically underserved communities, and also think about those socially vulnerable populations that may be disproportionately impacted from a disaster. So the definitions include, talk about underserved communities being populations sharing a particular char characteristic as well as geographic communities that have been systematically denied a full opportunity to participate in aspects of economic, social, and civic life. And then social vulnerability is the potential for loss within an individual or social group 
it recognizes that traits influence an individual's or group's resilience or their ability to prepare, respond, cope, or recover from an event. So these groups listed here are the combination of both of those. Um, they're listed in the local handbook, and um, we've kind of tried to come up with that comprehensive list. Inclusive planning processes take time and thoughtful planning to be set up in a way that provides everyone, all of these groups, with the resources necessary to meaningfully participate in, make progress towards, and benefit from hazard mitigation. There are different kinds of equity that can relate to your mitigation plan and planning processes. Our, for our webinar today, we'll focus mostly on procedural and distributional equity. Procedural equity is committing to equity in the planning process itself. So it means making clear, fair, and inclusive processes, working with partners who represent underserved groups and socially vulnerable populations, to design and implement outreach and engagement methods that will reach the most vulnerable members of the community. And it also means giving chances for meaningful input. Underserved groups should have a true voice in planning and prioritizing mitigation. Invite organizations that support these groups to join the local mitigation planning team. Welcome them to share their input throughout the planning process. That was about procedural equity and then distributional equity asks, are programs resulting in the fair sharing of benefits and burdens across the community? Do they focus on areas and populations with the greatest need? And distributional equity is really critical when you're doing your risk assessment. This is when communities should assess where hazards may disproportionately harm certain areas and people. And then when the local government is setting its goals and actions and state and tribal governments, it's vital to use that distributional equity lens so that you can assess where the benefits of mitigation are needed the most and whether they are reaching, they're going to reach them. Equitable mitigation planning can be carried through to all types of community planning. If the mitigation actions are designed to benefit underserved communities, like we were just talking about, prioritizing them, identifying actions that benefit underserved communities. Then when you integrate them with other community planning processes, it can really advance equity for the whole community. So coming to the policies of local and state mitigation planning, the local mitigation policy guide, um, equity is encouraged throughout the planning process. So in the planning process part, it's described that the plan must describe an opportunity for the representatives of nonprofits and community-based organizations to participate in the planning process um, that work directly with, with underserved populations. And then the second aspect of it is actually direct opportunity for underserved communities to have the opportunity to participate in the public participation process. So there's two aspects to the planning process. And in the risk assessment, the risk assessment must describe the vulnerability of each participating jurisdictions, jurisdiction to the identified hazards. And this includes the vulnerability of people, including underserved communities and socially vulnerable populations. The mitigation strategy should include actions that benefit underserved communities and socially vulnerable populations. Actions can be evaluated using qualitative benefits, including how they benefit underserved and socially vulnerable populations. And in the state planning policy, the state plans happen at the state government level. So equity looks a little bit different in those plans. It primarily comes out in who the state brings to the planning process, how they describe the vulnerability of underserved communities and social, socially vulnerable populations, and how the state supports local government efforts to mitigate with equity in mind. So in the state guide also, it's encouraged throughout the planning process that first the planning process should describe how the state coordinated with state agencies that have programs, policies, assistance that supports underserved communities. 
And the risk assessment must analyze vulnerability to hazards in terms of jurisdictions and populations most vulnerable to damage and loss. It must also summarize the changes in development and demographics. Both must consider socially vulnerable and underserved communities. The plan must describe the effectiveness of local mitigation programs and capabilities. That is pretty much in the mitigation strategy part. And then the plan must also describe how the state considers communities with the highest risk when they're prioritizing jurisdictions for grant funding. Thank you. Over to you, Jessica. All right, thank you so much, Shuba. Um, our next presenter is Jackie Larenzar. Jackie currently works for the City of Oakland Department of Race and Equity, where they are a program analyst focused on supporting city departments and staff on the application of racial equity tools in their lines of business. Jackie has worked as a racial equity professional for more than 20 years, starting in the city of Seattle, where they were part of the team that implemented the first racial and social justice initiative in the, in the country and in Martin Luther King County elections, where they managed the language access program and helped to design and implement programs to increase voter turnout and education for US citizens, especially those impacted by racial disparities in access to voting. Jackie, I am going to pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm very happy to be here and I'm going to um, start to explain to you how we do equity in Oakland. Uh, somebody had a question about frameworks and it's really important that you are clear about what framework you're going to use to implement equity. Uh, before you start your planning, it, it, it's, uh, it has a big impact on how you go about doing your planning process. So um, our department was the first in the country. Is the, there are now many other departments of race and equity around the country, but Oakland was the first. And we came to Oakland with the idea of really truly changing the city as an institution that uh, centers racial equity and serves those who are most impacted by racial disparities. We've done a lot of uh, framework uh, building around some core uh, goals, and I'm going to talk to you about this. So next slide, please. So we were created in 2015. It took about a year to get the whole uh, structure of the department adopted. Uh, doing racial equity work is in our municipal code. It's very specific. So in Oakland, doing equity work is the law and the responsibility of every city department and uh, staff, elected official. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the way we do it, this is the vision that the city had set for equity is a city that will intentionally integrate on a citywide basis the principles of fair and just and all the city does <clears throat> to achieve equitable opportunities for all people and communities. Uh, this was the result of many, many years of community organizing from the folks in Oakland, particularly Black and indigenous folks, uh, Latinos, that for many years uh, had asked the city to address disparities. So I was very happy to come and join this team to, to respond to those uh, requests from the community. Uh, or the department supports uh, all the planning processes that the city does and we help uh, to embed racial equity through technical assistance, training, and uh, other activities that support equity and the change of the institution. Uh, next slide. So how do we do this? We really focus on setting up an uh, internal structure to manage the change process. So all departments have a role to play, as I was saying. Uh, we provide training, messaging, analysis, uh, tools, and technical support, uh, 
and a theory of change that centers all the work that we do. Uh, the department staff receive coaching one-on-one -on -one in groups. Uh, we also have some tools that we have designed particularly for Oakland, a racial equity analysis worksheet and an inclusive engagement work guide that is based on the International Association for, for Public Participation model. And uh, then using those tools, we work on changing policies, practices, procedures that benefit communities that have been divested under serve for many, many years. And uh, through that process, we identified actions to advance racial equity. Uh, we structure change in a way that allows us to uh, change policies, practices, and procedures to move the work forward and serve the folks that we have identified through data analysis of racial disparities in population level uh, census data and other uh, data tools. And then through that process, we start uh, changing the plans, designing policies, uh, practices, and procedures. So we focus on uh, equity change process that is this box here in the in the right uh, we identify people who want to work with us to advocate and take leadership on equity we build infrastructure uh, that supports the political will and internal change uh, we create spaces where people can practice and apply these tools and skills develop plans focus on changing policies procedures and practices and measure progress and recognize accomplishments done by the departments and or individuals that had really uh, supported the change in the work that they do every day for the city next slide so this process allows us to really look at every plan every policy standard procedures and identify the things that we need to change to remove barriers so the outcomes for the communities that we have identified as being the most impacted by racial disparities can start changing from uh, those disparities to some somewhere where we really have equity in Oakland uh, we start by naming the desired future condition that we want to see so this is kind of like our equity goal and uh, these are just examples of some of the goals that we have set uh, every plan that we work on it starts with this we identify a desired future condition for for uh, the populations uh, then we gather disparity data to understand the conditions in and this includes talking to people because we we found that a lot of times there is data but there is not disaggregated by race and so the only way for you to really find out how people are experiencing those disparities what are the barriers what 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 is it that you need to remove or focus to really change the conditions that are impacting them is to talk to them in oakland uh the most impacted communities are African American, Indigenous, Latinos, and in some areas, uh, Asian, Asian groups, uh, Asian Pacific Islander groups. Uh, as I was saying, then we work with the impacted community to really have a complete view of what what is the root cause of this problem of. Uh, and deep in the, the understanding that we have about these things. Uh, I think a lot of times we can know a lot by just looking at data, past reports, uh, talking to community organizations, but we really need to uh, talk to people who have lived experience on how this looks for them. Uh, we found in different neighborhoods in Oakland, my experience the same issue in a different way. And so uh, we try to work with them to see what would be the best way to go about resolving the issues for them, not for us, for them. And uh, that's how we go about designing the equity approaches uh, with rigorous performance measures. We use a results-based accountability model that really measures over time 
how we are uh, improving conditions for this uh, communities in Oakland. And then you repeat as needed. But this is this is very, the very high level process that we apply to all the plans. Next slide. So this process citywide has created a really rigorous, strong outcome focus uh, framework that influences major and council priorities, general plans and specific plans, other council plans that have been adopted, uh, departmental strategic plans, policies, programs and procedures, and public input. We have a very robust uh, internal work work group that focuses just on engagement and how we can improve the city's processes uh, and skills to really work with folks who are impacted by racial disparities and who due to structural racism have been uh, not engaged with their government. Uh, we have done work so everybody in the city has embraced equity and inclusion as a shared value and this is now reflected on how we go about prioritizing uh, certain factors. We have some geographic and uh, census indicators of well-being that help us to center what, what are the pr problem areas and how we can uh, center the work that the city is doing. And then all that gets uh, rolled into the specific actions of performance metrics in plans that uh, advance equity. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of examples of how we've done this. Uh, one is the equitable climate action plan in Oakland and our mitigation uh, plan. Next slide, please. So uh, because we have really integrated data into our approach and pursuing equity, uh, as I was saying, we use the analysis worksheet, we use the engagement guide to really help us center underserved communities. And within those underserved communities, we, we are very intentional about being inclusive of people with disabilities, people who do not speak English as a first language. Uh, and there might be other things that, uh, depending on the cities that you are, or the populations that you're working with, that you need to pay particular attention. So the tool really helps us to identify who are those stakeholders and who do we need to talk to and what are the things that they, they might need in, case, in a case of emergency, in the case of a climate event, for us to really uh, be able to respond to their needs and and in a way that it's really helpful to them. Uh, <clears throat> we did uh, an analysis of 72 different indicators of well-being for the city. We disaggregated the data by race, and that's how we know who are the most impacted by disparities in Oakland and what are the areas that we needed to focus. We have 12 indicators that score the worst out of 100, they score between uh, three and eight, so they're very bad. And so those became our priorities, and we've been working on them for uh, four years now, and, and we're starting to see some progress. Uh, we also develop, in collaboration with one of our departments, a geographic equity toolbox that took some of these indicators, and we mapped it using GIS technology. And so that, that gave us a map of the priority areas, we call them priority equity neighborhoods uh, in Oakland. And so that's what we prioritize in all of our planning. Next slide, please. So the racial equity implementation guide is just a tool that we redesigned for the equitable climate action plan that really took the racial equity analysis worksheet and the guide we uh, worked together to kind of combine them and create a one tool that allowed people that were working on on this 30-year plan to really get a clear picture of uh, who were the most impacted by climate events what type of climate events in what areas of Oakland 
And then uh, how did we need to focus our actions and activities to engage them in the implementation of the plan? And uh, prior to that, also in the, the making of the plan, because uh, we really wanted the community to be part of this planning process and, and feel that they had part, not only participated in giving us their opinion, but also that they could see themselves being part of the implementation of the actions, that they could see how they, they could do something to be not only prepared for climate. Uh, events or to mitigate uh, em emergencies, but also to do preventive actions to help us be even more ready to fare better in case of, of emergencies or, uh, or a climate event. Next, next slide. So I'm just gonna give you some of the examples of the results that, that this process uh, produce. Uh, we were able to engage 5,000 Oakland residents in different types of events throughout the city, throughout all neighborhoods. We started with those areas that uh, we identified had not been engaged in past planning processes. We started with them, we met with them, we asked them about what were the best ways to reach them, what were the things that worked for them. Uh, we even talked about the level of language that we needed to have in our materials and how we presented things. So people understood what, what we were talking about, what we were trying to do. Uh, folks also suggested that they wanted to learn how our government worked better. So we also did that. It was kind of like prep work and uh, we hire a consultant to work on this. Uh, because we did all that engagement process for about a year and a half, uh, we created really robust uh, and solid relationships with a lot of these communities and organizations and individuals. And so when we started the actual writing of the plan, uh, the people in the sustainability office really wanted folks to to, to know how that process was. So we co growed the plan with about 2000 plus folks in Oakland using an app. And it was a lot of work internally, I have to say, but uh, it really helped people to feel that we were being responsive and that they had a true voice in the actions and activities that were going in the plan. Uh, and uh, Another piece of this is that we had a lot of scientists and climate experts also working on the technical pieces of this, but uh, we really wanted to make sure that folks didn't feel that the science we had all this climate uh, work was a barrier for them to participate and, and really be part of the efforts to help the city to be ready. Uh, the engagement was conducted by a consultant, I was saying, and uh, we, we've been told that it's innovative in six different ways, but uh, go, go, next slide, don't worry. So uh, what I think is really important is that it's really included in the design, the local community knowledge, the wisdom that they brought to the table was integrated in every single climate action in the plan and in the planning. Uh, the regulatory requirements were used as the floor and we went a lot of times beyond that because uh, we found out that uh, through the community process that we needed to do some things in order to really address some of the concerns. And so, uh, we work with them on that. Uh, we also started to understand how people saw climate risk and impacts at the human scale. So not just the science and how it was gonna impact the region and the city, but really at the individual level, at the neighborhood level, at the street level, like how they were living that. And, and we tried to, uh, uh, as much as possible, to really uh, translate that into the actions in the plan. Uh, the measures were chosen based on the potential health benefits for uh, communities that were most impacted by racial disparities. And this is because we have, uh, uh, we truly believe that when you center the most impacted, everybody benefits. Uh, 
So you, when you remove barriers for those who have the hardest uh, time accessing services or information, then it becomes easier for everybody. And that's just uh, how we go about doing our mitigation plan, the ECAP, any plan that we do, that's, that's one of the, the um, precepts that we apply to how we do planning. Uh, the plans were geographically focused in the, on frontline communities. So we truly did, did stand with them and, and did this process with them. And uh, the plan, the language also included explicit references to equity and environmental justice that actually came from organizations in Oakland that had been working on environmental justice for many, many, many years. Uh, this also translated because a lot of this work uh, uh, kind of created a baseline for other things. Uh, a lot of this work translated into the actions in our mitigation planning, in our tree master plan, in our paving plans. So basically, a lot of the equity analysis that's, that was done for the climate plan, uh, then influence a lot of other areas of planning in the city or general planning uh, or general plan for the city, the mitigation plan, uh, transportation planning. So we, we keep that really front and center. So folks can uh, find the, in the overlap of actions between all those plans and, and we make sure that we're not contradicting uh, what we're trying to do in one place by actions that we're taking on another. Next. So these are just some of the resources that uh, we would like to offer you if you would like to try to do a process like this. Uh, my department is only two people. So I can really tell you that you can do this. All you need to do is to uh, learn how to do this and get a little bit of help if you have questions we're happy to support anybody who wants to do this process and really center communities that are impacted for from disparities and uh, that's it if you have any questions i'm very happy to answer them you'll get this uh, i i believe the organizers are gonna send all this to you so you you'll have all these uh, tools available Thank you. All right, thank you, Jackie. Yes, and Corey also dropped uh, some of the links that were on that previous slide into the chat. So you can directly click there as well. All right, so we are actually going to go into our first polling question. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and launch that now. Um, you have about 45 seconds to answer. Um, the question here is, which indices or tools do you already use in your work to identify underserved or socially vulnerable communities? And this is multiple of choice, so please uh, select all that apply. And if you have used an other tool um, that's not listed here, uh, please feel free to share that tool in the chat. Um, and then so just a reminder here again um, to please answer the polling questions um, if you would like to claim credit for uh, continuation, continuing education credit for today's webinar. All right, a few more seconds here and then I will end the poll and share the results. Okay, it looks like answers have slowed. So I will end the poll and share the results with you all. Um, so it looks like there's a fairly uh, even distribution um, across uh, some of the existing tools we've listed here with um, the CRCI tool uh, from FEMA being um, one of the more highly utilized tools already. Um, so this actually sets up uh, sets us up nicely for our next presenter, Kate, um, who will be discussing these tools in greater detail. Um, Kate uh, works for FEMA's Recovery Office uh, of Equity and Strategic Initiatives, OESI, as the Equity Section Chief. Prior to joining OESI, 
Kate served as an equity advisor in the Resilience Front Office, where she led the development of an equity data standard for resilience grants, established a resilience equity community of practice, and served as the agency's Justice 40 coordinator. Kate's work at FEMA has also involved working in the hazard mitigation assistance policy section where she managed a stakeholder working group of mitigation professionals representing tribal, state, and local government. Before joining FEMA, Kate worked for the District Department of Energy and Environment, where she coordinated the five-year update of the district's 20-year sustainability plan, uh, Sustainable DC 2.0. All right, Kate, I will pass it off to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Jessica. Next slide, please. All right, so the big question that I wanna start with is how are indices and tools helpful in our day-to-day -day work? First, there's three things. First, they help with targeting outreach. Indices and tools can provide planners with the data needed to tailor outreach in specific and nuanced ways based on the unique characteristics of the populations in the area that we're working in. Second, they help with planning. Data from these indices and tools can provide helpful insights for planning efforts. And then finally, uh, they help with mitigation investments. Knowing the community's demographics and unique characteristics can help in the siting and planning of mitigation investments too. Next slide. So the big question is, with so many different indices and tools available, um, which of these indices and tools can aid in identifying underserved and or disadvantaged communities? And which of these indices and tools can help us understand the unique characteristics of these communities as part of the hazard mitigation planning process? There are a variety of indices and tools that can be used to identify underserved and or disadvantaged communities. And today I'm just gonna walk through three of the most commonly used indices and tools. So the poll that you just took are the three that I'm gonna to cover today. This is definitely not an exhaustive list. It's just a few examples. And some of these indices and tools are more environmentally justice focused, while others are more so focused on social vulnerability. So I'm going to cover the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, or CGEST, first. So what is CGEST? Um, in January 2021, President Biden issued an executive order, 14008. It's also known as the Justice 40 Executive Order. And this order directed the Council on Environmental Quality, also known as CEQ, to develop a new screening tool. This tool became known as CGEST, or the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. The tool has an interactive map and uses data sets that are indicators of burdens across eight categories. So the categories include climate change, energy, health, housing, legacy pollution, transportation, water and wastewater, and workforce development. The tool uses this information to then identify communities that are experiencing these burdens. These are the communities that are then deemed disadvantaged because they are overburdened and underserved. CGEST was developed for federal agencies and federal agencies were directed to use this tool to help identify disadvantaged communities that will benefit from programs included in the Justice 40 initiative. So going back to what Shuba had shared before, it is a tool to aid in the distributional benefits it's a distributional equity tool because it identifies disadvantaged communities and then federal agencies are directed to use this tool to direct benefits to these disadvantaged areas as part of the Justice 40 initiative. And Justice 40 seeks to deliver 40% of the overall benefits of investments in climate, clean energy and related areas to disadvantaged communities. So all the data in this tool is publicly available data. It's at the census tract level. It is a binary tool, which I wanna point out. So using this tool, you're either disadvantaged or you're not at the census tract level. There are partially disadvantaged census tracts and these tracts contain land within the boundaries of federally recognized tribes, tribes so that the parts of the tract that contain the land of tribes are considered disadvantaged. And so the tool will display uh, this type of census tract as partially disadvantaged. 
I do wanna just end with saying that this tool, since it is binary and you're either disadvantaged or not, there's no score and there's no scale to it. And so that is something important to keep in mind when you're considering using this tool in your work. Next slide. So basically, oh, sorry, go back one. Thanks. Um, so basically the, the methodology is communities are considered disadvantaged if they're in census tracts that meet the threshold for at least one of the tools categories of burden, or if they are on lands of federally recognized tribes. Next slide. Uh, this table here just lays out all the indicators contained within the CGES tool, just so you get a sense of what's included in there. Um, at the top there, climate change, energy, health, those are the eight overall indicator categories I mentioned. And then within each of these categories, there are more specific data, such as diabetes, lack of in indoor plumbing, et cetera. So just wanted to give you a brief snapshot of, of what the data looks like. Next slide. And here's a screenshot that illustrates an example of one census tract happens to be in Sarasota, Florida. And in this census tract, it is this census tract in particular is not deemed disadvantaged using CGES. Um, and as you can see on this screen for this census tract, you can see each individual indicator and the tool ranks most of the burdens using percentiles. So percentiles show how much burden each tract experiences when, when compared to other tracts. Thresholds or cutoffs are used to determine if communities in a tract are disadvantaged and certain burdens use percentages or a simple yes or no. So this is really just to illustrate one census tract and the data that you can pull out by using CGEST on this particular area. Next slide. Okay, the next um, tool I'm going to talk about is the Environmental Justice Screening and Mapping Tool, or EJ Screen. Next slide. This is an EPA's Environmental Justice Mapping and Screening Tool. It's been around for a while. It was recently updated, and it provides EPA with a nationally consistent data set and approach for combining environmental and demographic socioeconomic indicators. Similar to CGEST, all the EJ screen indicators are publicly available data. EJ screen simply provides a way to display this information and includes a method for combining environmental and demographic indicators into EJ ind indices. EJ screen includes 13 environmental indicators, seven socioeconomic indicators, 13 EJ ind indexes, and 13 supplemental indices. Next slide. Just want to show you graph um, a visual of what it looks like to use EJ Screen. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can use EJ Screen, um, and it provides so the tool provides a number of capabilities, including color coded mapping, the ability to generate a standard report for a selected area, comparison showing how a selected area compares to the state or the nation. And you can use this screening tool in a, in a variety of ways as well. So it can help with informing outreach and engagement practices, as well as enhancing geographically based initiatives. Next slide. So you may be wondering, what's the relationship between CGEST and EJ Screen? And how does CGEST differ from EJ Screen? The tools are intended to serve different purposes. So while CGES primarily helps federal agencies such as FEMA to identify funding opportunities pursuant to the Justice 40 initiative, EJ Screen is designed to help the agencies when conducting environmental reviews and making permitting and enforcement decisions. The two, two tools overlap and can be used together, not just by government agencies, but also by regulated entities, advocacy groups, and individuals to help inform decisions about environmental matters with a lens on EJ concerns. So EJ Screen and CGES complement each other. EJ Screen provides a tool to screen for potential disproportionate environmental burdens and harms at the community level, while CGES defines and maps disadvantaged communities for the purpose of informing how federal agencies guide the benefits of certain programs, including through the Justice 40 initiative. I do want to stress that even though CGEST was developed for the Justice 40 initiative, it doesn't have to be used exclusively for Justice 40 programs. Um, CGEST uses a threshold methodology 
Again, it's a binary tool. You're either disadvantaged or not, and defines in a very definitive way what a disadvantaged community is. An EJ screen, on the other hand, is a full analytical tool with multiple methods of calculation, and it creates indexes. It won't say census track X, for instance, is disadvantaged. So that's sort of how they relate. Next slide. Okay, the last uh, index that I would like to talk about is the Community Resilience Challenges Index. This is a FEMA index, and back in 2017, FEMA's National Integration Center, also known as the NIC, identified a need to establish a data-driven basis for prioritizing locations for investments and guiding local emergency management planning. So with the support of Argonne National Lab, this index, the Community Resilience Challenges Index, or CRCI, was first developed for counties and then later was expanded to include census track level data. So it came out for counties in 2018, and then just recently in 2022, um, the index was expanded to include census tracks. Um, in 2022, Argonne researchers also updated their literature review and evaluated 14 peer-reviewed methodologies to identify the 22 research-supported indicators of community resilience that are contained within the CRCI. Next slide. This is just a, a visual to show you what the CRCI looks like. Um, the, it provides a score to each census tract that is a relative measure of the challenge to resilience based on the aggregate of the standardized scores of those 22 commonly used indicators. That's kind of a mouthful, but I think one thing that's really interesting to with this uh, CRCI index is, and you can see it in sort of that snapshot in the bottom right of the screen, is for each census track, you can learn the top three drivers of the CRCI value for that census track or county. So it really creates sort of like a high level. You can get down into the weeds and pull out the individual data points, but you can also see sort of the top three um, drivers that um, are impacting that particular community's um, uh, challenges to resiliency. Next slide. Okay, so you may be wondering, how do I know which tool to select? I just highlighted three different indices or tools, but I think you need to first start with asking yourself, what is the outcome you're trying to achieve? Then which variables are most relevant to those outcomes or to that outcome. Next, which index has the variables you need? Do you need individual data points? Is that important for your work? And then finally, is a scale or binary index helpful? So a binary tool like CGES perhaps won't help you to rank and prioritize, um, but when you have an index or tool that has a scale, you're able to do that. So thinking through those sets of questions and starting with your outcome, I think is a really good way um, to decide which index or tool or perhaps multiple that you wanna use for your work. Next slide. So just some general tips for selecting an index or tool. I do wanna stress there's no single perfect index or tool. It doesn't exist. Um, an index is just an index and a tool is just a tool and you know your community best and the residents within that community know their community best. A census tract is also large. And so if you're able to use more granular data and have conversations as part of the hazard mitigation planning process, that will truly be impactful. Um, and if you're really starting with the index or tool being that sort of guide, and then supplementing with those conversations, I truly believe you will end with a better planning process and outcome. Next slide. I know we're running low on time, so I will try to be brief here. I just wanna go over an example scenario of using these indices and tools. Okay, so let's start with this CGEST. Um, let's start with CGEST because it can be a first level screen. The area highlighted on the screen here in blue are census tracts that the federal government has identified as disadvantaged. And these are areas you should be identifying in your plan. Click on each individual, indi excuse me, click on each individual census tract to then learn why these areas are identified as disadvantaged. Next slide. 
The demographics of this particular track show that there's a high concentration of elderly individuals over the age of 65, as well as individuals that identify as Hispanic or Latino. This may indicate a challenge in the mobility of the population. Additionally, it may indicate the need for translation or outreach materials before, during, or after a disaster, and this could mean that they're more vulnerable to the impacts of hazards. It'll be important to these populations throughout the planning process, not just so that they are aware of their risks, but to also understand that risk from their perspective while working together to develop mitigation solutions. So looking at the details under climate change, for instance, here using again CGES, we can start to see potential hazard risk. The climate change indicators show that this area is above the 90th percentile for both projected flood risk and projected wildfire risk. Using this information as a good place to start, you can then leverage the CRCI to understand a little more about the local demographics as well as specific risk. Next slide. So now we're jumping to using the CRCI, which is housed within FEMA's resilience analysis and planning tool. As you can see here, several areas show high concentrations of elderly population, and it's not limited to the example census tract. Next slide. Using the CRCI, we can see here that limited English proficiency is six to 11%, but other communities in the area may also benefit from translated materials. Next slide. But there are even more variables to explore here. For example, populations with a disability may also have mobility and other challenges and could be vulner more vulnerable to the impacts of hazards. It'll also be important to reach out to groups supporting these populations during the planning process. Next slide. Using the CRCI, we can also see that there's a higher concentration of mobile homes in this particular census tract than in other areas of the community. Mobile homes may be at greater risk of damage to natural hazards, including flooding and earthquakes. Using these variables that comprise the CRCI, you can start to layer potential vulnerability, vulnerable areas in your community and understanding what they may be experiencing. Through this example, we have now learned that this census tract has both a higher concentration of mobile homes and elderly individuals. Next slide. Finally, using the CRCI, you can review the overall CRCI ranking by census tract, which aggregates all 22 variables. The map shows that our, our example census tract has medium high challenges to resiliency. Next slide. You can also take a look at how the CRCI ranking and all 22 variables individually interact with the identified hazard areas. This shows that the census tract has areas within the SFHA and is adjacent to recent wildfire incidents. This data should be fact-checked as part of the planning process through engagement, through conversations, but should be start, used as sort of a first layer screen. I know that was a lot, but I um, really wanted to sort of reiterate that there are all these different indices and tools out there, um, and you should um, play around with them and figure out which ones work best for your particular project and perhaps even layer them together. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, we now have a final polling question for the webinar. Again, we'll have about uh, 45 seconds to answer the poll. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that now. Um, the question is, what resources could help you build equity into your mitigation planning process? And please select all that apply. And if there's something else you're looking for, take that into the chat. Um, another reminder, please um, submit a response to the polling question if you're looking for um, credits, uh, continuing education credits. Um, I know we are running close on time here. Um, I will try to squeeze in um, a question or two here at the end, um, and then I will uh, go ahead and just uh, share a couple of slides that have some resources on them, but wanted to acknowledge several questions that have popped up in the chat and um, in the Q&A that we will compile a list of resources. We will be sending out the slides that have links to those resources. So um, we'll try to get you uh, the most information as possible in our follow-up to the webinar. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now and share our results. Um, 
a community engagement toolkit, uh, training on available tools, again, a pretty even distribution. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and I'm going to move on to a question. Um, <clears throat> I welcome our presenters to also turn on their cameras if they'd uh, feel comfortable. Um, I'll try to start with one question for Jackie, which is, um, what kind of a relationship building had to be done to gain so much participation? Do you feel you now have a stronger connection to the communities you engaged with? And how yes. do the communities feel about the process? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I'll i tell you, when I got to Oakland, uh, I was appalled at how little relationships the city had with anybody. And there were no processes. Uh, we didn't have staff trained to do this, though there were some very uh, courageous city employees that tried to do it on their own, with their own means. Uh, and I think a lot, uh, this is very common in a lot of government agencies. Uh, so we had a lot of work to do. And the first, the first things that, that we did was really find out who were our stakeholders especially in communities of color. And I, I, I was chatting with somebody that, you know, I was telling them, Oakland has a really long history of uh, advocating and of really having a hard time with its local government. So we had to own that. We had to own uh, the mistakes that the city had made as a city, how we had colluded with other agencies and other governments in creating damage for some uh, black communities in particular. And we were, we really train employees to be able to listen to that, to sit with community and learn and listen about the impacts. Uh, over time, it took five years. And I think still, we still have a difficult relationship with some organizations, but it's starting to shift. And I think it's because people are starting to see that we really mean it, that we really are serious about correcting what we did in the past and mitigating any ne negative impacts that our planning decisions might have. And we are willing to listen and uh, sit with them and try to find solutions. So if, if we cannot prevent something to happen, then the conversation is about how do we mitigate the negative impacts of this? And those are very hard conversations because sometimes, uh, you know, we we found that people thought that we have control over things that we didn't, and so then using our influence as a city to bring in that other organization, like the Air District, for example, and and have those conversations. Uh, I think those things go a long way, but you have to work a lot on having a clear goal and a clear vision about how you're gonna get there. And so what I tell people is that we might not take the same path to the goal because we're government and a lot of things are uh, that we do are regulated by laws and other agencies and stuff. So community can do things that we cannot do, but if we have the same goal, and we are in communication and we are really we're really serious about removing barriers for them then uh, those relationships start transforming into more collaborative and more uh i think uh that's when the magic happens basically when when you we really are working together toward the same goal thank you jackie um, I know we are over time here, so I don't want to hold people up with their for their next meeting. Um, we have been answering questions in the chat. Um, again, if your questions were um, not answered, please feel free to reach out to your presenters. Again, here's a list of resources that we talked through um, during the presentation today, and we will be sharing these with you. Um, again, you're eligible for professional credits. If you're looking for CFM, C, uh, CECs for your CFM, please reach out to me directly or uh, type your name and email address in the chat. Um, and again, here are the, uh, here's the contact information from our presenters today. 
And um, again, we had a lot of questions come through, a lot of great questions come through. So um, please feel free to reach out um, if you, uh, you know, weren't able to get yours answered today. Um, so just wanted to, to thank you all for joining and to please stay tuned for uh, future From Policy to Action webinars um, hosted by FEMA's National Mitigation Planning Program. And again, a huge thank you to all of our presenters today. Thank you. Thank you all for attending.